Good afternoon, everybody. I think it is time for us to begin because I know that people planned for us to start at three and they have other places to be. So good afternoon and welcome to this, the next installment of our UMAPS colloquium series. If you've been at the previous two of these that we've had this year, you would have heard me say the following and I will say it at each one of our colloquiums because it is necessary to thank every time the people that make this program possible. Um, so thank you to the University of Michigan and specifically the offices of the President and the Provost who's been supporting the UMAPS program for many, many years. Um, we also get support from the Department of Afro-American and African Studies for the UMAPS program. And then we get support from various individual donors and foundations and also increasingly from individual faculty at the University of Michigan who often have funding, grant funding, and then um, want to work with an African scholar and then make the money available to support the UMAPS program. So thank you to everybody who has supported the program um, financially to make it possible. Um, but it's not just financial resources that is necessary to run a program like this. It's also people resources and a lot of people contribute to this. Um, probably most importantly is our UMAP scholars, so thank you to all of you for having applied to the program and then having left your home and family and work on the continent and come and spend five or six months with us here. I know it's a sacrifice, I know you leave things at home to come here and kind of live a little bit like a student again. We really appreciate that we as a university benefit greatly from your presence on this campus. Um, it's an opportunity for our students and faculty and staff to learn about Africa from African scholars themselves rather than only read about it in a book. So really important for us to, to have you on, on campus with us. And then also, as I say every time and will continue saying, Please, when you get back home, thank your families that they have lived without you for this long and thank your universities and your colleagues who have given you the leave to come and often therefore have to do extra teaching and administration to, to make it possible for you to come. So please thank them also from us because we benefit from the fact that they allow you to come and study here. So please transfer also our thanks to your colleagues back home. Um, so today we have three presenters. Today we are in the um, area of social sciences and humanistic social sciences, roughly speaking. And our first presenter today is Lorette Arendse, who comes to us from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, um, where she is a faculty member in the law faculty. And here at University of Michigan, Lorette works with Professor Susan Page from the Law School and the Ford School of Public Policy, and also with Professor Pam Brandwine from Political Science. Lorette? Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and good evening to my special people in South Africa. They know who they are. Um, I want to thank the African Studies Center for granting me the opportunity to present my research today. Yeah. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience who, who has taken the time to attend my presentation, um, especially my fellow UMAPS um, scholars. And also a word of thanks to those who are joining us virtually, in particular my host, Professor Pamela Brand Brandwine. So broadly speaking, my research predominantly focuses on the pervasive systemic inequality in the South African public basic education system. Basic education in South Africa consists of 12 years of schooling, starting from grade one up until grade 12, which is the final year before students enter tertiary education. For this afternoon, I will focus on the role that the South African courts play in transforming the public education system. In 2009, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, which is, let me just go down. In 
In 2009, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, which is comparable in status to the U.S. Supreme Court, delivered a judgment that is considered to be very influential in broader education law jurisprudence. This judgment is known as Mupamalanga Department of Education versus High School Ermelua. So I want to read a quote from this judgment. It's, it's on the screen. Apartheid authorized a hierarchy of privilege and disadvantage. Access to public education must no exception. While much remedial work has been done since the advent of constitutional democracy, sadly deep social disparities and resultant social inequity are still with us. The Constitution demands that this social unevenness be addressed by a radical transformation of society as a whole and of public ed uh, education in particular. So the Constitutional Court's clarion call for a radical transformation of public education emanates firstly from the textual design of the Constitution. Chapter 2 of the South African Constitution, which consists of the Bill of Rights, demands the realization of transformation through an explicit entrenchment of socio-economic rights, such as the right to basic education and an equality clause that endorses a substantive approach to equality. The Constitutional Court has confirmed that the substantive approach to equality roots itself in a transformative constitutional philosophy which acknowledges that there are patterns of systemic advantage and disadvantage in South African society based on race and other factors that need expressly to be faced up to and overcome if equality is to be achieved. The court's call, the constitutional court's call for radical transformation is secondly a response to the historical and contemporary context of the South African public education system. So what is this particular context? So on this slide, you see two images of two different schools. Um, you may be surprised to know that the one factor that these two schools have in common is that both are public schools. Um, at the bottom is an image of a former white school, and the top picture portrays an image of a former black school. As a point of clarif clarification, public schools in South Africa have been deracialized since the early 1990s, However, de facto segregation can still continue along the lines of race specifically. In former white schools, class sizes can be as low as 20 students per class, whereas in, former blacks, in some former black schools, especially in the poorer rural areas, class sizes can, exceed, uh, e can easily exceed 100 learners per classroom. Um, a bifurcated schooling system, public schooling system, therefore operates in post-apartheid South Africa. Former white schools continue to be adequately resourced, whilst many former black schools still lack the most basic of resources, such as proper sanitation, electricity, and even water. The education policies of the former uh, colonial and apartheid administrations guaranteed superior resources and a better standard of education to white learners, um, whereas black learners were confined to schools characterized by deplorable physical conditions and an education of inferior quality. Sadly, this legacy of colonialism and apartheid is still with us today. Although the current South African government should be applauded for the policies they have implemented so far to address these historical imbalances, the legacy of our colonial and apartheid past remains deeply rooted in our education system. Um, before I proceed any further, I want to make it very clear that we should guard against viewing inequality in South African schools through a very rigid lens in terms of which every former white school is good and every former bl black school is bad. The situation on the ground is much more nuanced and complex, but I simply do not, do, do not, do not have the time to explain it more in detail. For now, it is crucial to drive the point home that many historically black schools perform exceptionally well in the post-apartheid schooling system, despite the obstacles they face on a daily basis. By the same token, merely attending a former white school is not an automatic indicator that a student is the recipient of a good quality of education. However, the crux of the picture I have painted so far remains valid. 
a bifurcated public basic education system which, which operates mostly along the lines of race and or socioeconomic class is a reality in our country. So I want to shift my, uh, my, my focus now to how the legal system has responded to this uh, systemic inequality. So unlike the United States Constitution, the South African Constitution entrenches a right to basic education. In the 2011 judgment of Juma Mushid Primary School versus SA, the Constitutional Court interpreted this right as follows. Uh, and I quote, the right to basic education is immediately realizable. There is no internal limitation requiring, requiring that the right be progressively realized within available resources subjected to reasonable legislative measures. So in non-legalese language, what this means is that every student can claim a basic education on demand from the South African state and that budgetary, budgetary constraints is not a justifiable excuse for limiting the right to basic education. So various civil society organizations in South Africa have instituted a range of uh, cases seemingly spurred on by the principle established in the Juma Mushid judgment that the right to basic education is immediately realizable and therefore directly enforceable. So these organizations uh, such as Equal Education and Section 27, for example, have argued in separate cases before the court, um, before the high court specifically, um, that a particular com component such as school infrastructure or textbooks or teachers is indispensable to the real realization of the right to basic education. These cases have been highly successful as they have resulted in the High Court specifically ordering the South African state to provide tangible outcomes in the form of textbooks or teachers or infrastructure to disadvantaged uh, schools in particular. Just go up. Um, ironically, because of the success of the civil society movement, I am of the opinion that a very narrow conceptualization of systemic inequality has developed. What I mean by this is that some legal academics, um, especially, tend to conceptualize inequality only in terms of the difference in resources between former black and former white schools. Of course, they are not entirely wrong to argue this. However, what is often overlooked is how schools by their very nature, in particular school governing bodies, are major role players in replicating patterns of inequality and of preserving historical privileges. And this is made possible by the autonomy they possess under, um, under the Schools Act to formulate and Im implement their own policies, um, as I will explain next. So um, in the context of public schooling, the term decentralization refers to the, uh, the transfer of decision-making decision authority from the state to the local school level. So the South African Schools Act, 84 of 1996, vests the governance of every public school in its school governing body. School governing bodies have been classified as organs of state by the Constitutional Court and has been referred to by some academics as a fourth arm of government. The Constitutional Court has also compared school governing bodies to legislative authorities responsible for the formulation of policies in order to guide the daily management of the school. Parents or the representatives of parents constitute the majority on school governing bodies. Teachers, non-teaching personnel and students at high schools only or secondary schools are also elected to school governing bodies. So the Schools Act confers a wide range of powers onto school governing bodies, including the power to determine their own admission policies, language policies, and codes of con conduct. And these are only a few um, of the functions um, I've mentioned here. The Schools Act lists numerous, numerous other functions. So how does exactly does the decentralized school governance system lead to a perpetuation of historical privileges in the South African public education system. 
So according to Crane Sudin, the decentralized form of school governance empowers former white schools in particular to maintain and in some insta instances to modify privilege privileges from the past. So in order to contextualize this argument, the uh, Ermelo judgment, which I referred to earlier, will be used as an example. So high school Ermelo is a historically former white school in the town of Ermelo in the northern part um, of South Africa. Until 2007, the school had always employed Afrikaans, which is my own language, as the exclusive medium of instruction. So the school was built, originally built, to accommodate uh, approximately 1,200 students, but at the time that the case was launched in court, only 500 at 589 students were registered at the school. So as a result, the student to class classroom ratio was about 23 learners um, per classroom. In contrast, former black schools in the same area um, accommodated up to 69 students um, per classroom. So due to the severe shortage of classroom space at English medium schools in the town of Ermelua, High School Ermelo was approached by the Provincial Education Department to enroll approximately 100 black English-speaking students. High School Ermelo was the only school in town with the capacity to accommodate these students. The school governing body refused to accommodate these students and they cited the exclusive Afrikaans medium policy and a shortage of space as justification for their refusal. Bear in mind that they they, had this, they were the school with the most space in, in the town. Um, as I have stated before, in terms of the Schools Act, school governing bodies may determine their own language policies. The school could therefore legally refuse to accommodate um, the English speaking students on the basis that they could not be, that they don't understand Afrikaans. However, the Department of Education urgently required classroom space from the school which was the only facility with the access capacity um, in the area, and the department also offered to appoint three English-speaking um, teachers. When the case went to court, um, the South Gauteng High Court um, rejected the school's argument that it had insufficient space to accommodate the learners as a smokescreen and found that high school Ermelo was doing everything in its power to remain an Afri Afrikaans medium institution. The court further held that the school adopted a strategy to bar access to the, to the English speaking learners. So I will now re read a passage from that judgment. And I quote, it is clear that the attitude of the applicants and the applicants in this case uh, were the school and the school governing body is to consign learners wanting to be taught in English to any conditions anywhere, as long as they do not set foot at their school. This is a callous attitude towards the educational interests of learners from other sections of the community. It is reminiscent of the pre-democratic era when the educational rights of white learners were better catered for than those, of, than those learners of a different color. Under, our, under the present constitution, all learners have equal rights to state facilities irrespective of language or color. So although the High Court did not explicitly characterize the school's actions as racial discrimination, this particular passage um, implies that the court um, was of the view that the school's intention was indeed racially motivated and that the Afrikaans language policy was used as an excuse to enforce this discrimination. So um, since this judgment was delivered, the Federation of Governing Bodies for South African Schools, which is a national representative of, of school governing bodies, has admitted that there are apparently instances where Afrikaans medium schools in particular have used their language policies as a mechanism for screening applications in a manner that suggests that the screening occurs with racist intent. The Ermelo judgment is merely one example where school governing bodies have attempted to use their powers under the Schools Act to preserve historical privileges. 
There have been other instances where students have been de denied access to, school, to schools because the wearing of Islamic headgear, the sporting of dreadlocks um, in accordance with the Rastafarian religion, and deciding to wear one's hair in an Afro hairstyle have been interpreted to be in violation of, of a school's code of conduct. So Eremalua is one of several cases um, where school governing bodies from primarily former white schools have become involved in a legal battle with the state in an effort to protect their decentralized powers under the Schools Act. Whenever these schools are confronted by the government who accuse them of exercising their autonomy in an exclusionary manner, the governing bodies, the school governing bodies, have recourse to the legal system. So um, these cases are usually instituted in the high courts as the courts of first instance and are usually appealed all the way um, to the Constitutional Court. The approach of the Constitutional Court has been far less progressive than that of the high courts. In cases where the constitutional validity of school policies have been in question, the Constitutional Court's approach has been to avoid reaching a decision on the, on the matter. Instead, the court refers the issue back to the disputing parties, namely the, namely the school governing body and the provincial education department to resolve the matter themselves. So the court's approach um, is rooted in a respect for the notion of the separation of powers doctrine, which among other things regard the school governing body as the most suitable institution to revise a school policy because it is a democratically elected body that in the a court's view best represents the school community's interest, interests. So I criticize this approach of the Constitutional Court um, in my PhD thesis, um, but I don't have time to go into more detail now. For now, it is suffice to say that the court's position of deference towards school governing bodies does not into, take into account that school governing bodies are not necessarily benevolent institutions that are loyal to the transformative vision of the South African Constitution. Instead, they are institutions that consist of members whose views may be rooted in a particular institutional culture that may lead to the exclusion of learners on the basis of various grounds, including race, gender, language, and so forth. So in conclusion, um, for the last few minutes of my presentation, I want to briefly discuss the project that I am exploring here at the University of Mich Michigan, the book project. So, so, so far the main theoretical lens through which I've explored my research has been a social justice perspective. Sub-themes under this broad paradigm involve, involves a harm reduction approach as well as a social transformation approach. Now in terms of a harm reduction approach, social change in education research is usually preoccupied with questions such as how can we make schools less unjust or how can we improve schooling outcomes. So this approach seeks to alleviate the consequences of white supremacy and colonialism by treating their symptoms as historical inequities to be mitigated. Social transformation in education research, on the other hand, recognizes that schools are social structures that can reproduce inequalities, and schools therefore in and of themselves must be transformed. My critique of the role of school governing bodies in perpetuating historical privileges in, in, in the South African public education system reflects this approach. So although social justice um, is generally committed to social change, that change is not necessarily decolonizing. For the book, apart from exploring and critiquing social justice, uh, social justice approach, I will also include a chap chapter that is tentatively, tentatively titled um, The Constitutional Politics of Postcolonialism in South Africa. And I have to thank my host, Professor Pamela Brandwine, who must take credit for coming up with a specific title. So subtopics to explore would include what is the difference between transformation and decolonization in education research? What is the constitutional court's conceptualization of, of transformation and decolonization as it relates to education? How has the politics of the court 
shape their view of these concepts and finally what are the limits of the constitutional court in effecting any type of social change in society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorette. So we have time for questions from the audience and we also have people on Zoom. Daniel is man, you know, managing the Zoom, so Daniel, you need to tell us if there are Zoom questions. But let's start with the audience that's here in person. Anybody? And for the sake of our Zoom audience, um, say who you are when you ask your question. Thanks. Uh, Anselm John, fellow UMAP scholar, Department of Physics, Stellenbosch University, <coughs> Um, also here in Michigan. Um, I've got a question that pertains to transformation in, mm. in schooling. Uh, do you know if zoning is used to determine admission policy and how that varies throughout the country? Because I've seen yeah. it come in and out. I wanted to know how widespread it is and what the current yeah. status was. Uh, okay. if, you, if you could tell yes. us about, about, about that. Okay, um, so in terms of um, uh, zoning regulations in, in South Africa, there is a difference. So zoning regulation simply means that whenever a, a, a child applies to school, um, what is taken to, into account whether that child will be admitted to a school, um, the regulations take into account uh, um, in the, take into account where the child, uh, the area in which the child lives and where the parent is employed uh, or where the parent resides. So I think uh, it differs a bit in the United States, it's more to do with uh, where the person lives. But in South Africa, it's also, the zoning regulations also takes into account where the parent is employed. So there, there is some differences across the provinces in South Africa. So um, in the country, except the Gauteng province, um, if a child lives or the parent lives or is employed within a five kilometer radius of the school, then that child will be put on wait on uh, will be um, will be put on waiting list A. So that child would in all probability probability be accepted to that school. Um, in Gauteng, from from where I am, um, the zoning regulations are different and that only happened because of a case, a court case that was was instituted. Yeah, I think it is 2016, around 2016. Um, so there the, the provincial regulations were changed. So if your child, or if the parent now lives or uh, is employed within a 30 kilometer radius of, of the school, then that child is played, placed on waiting list A. So that also greatly improves um, access, for example, for black children because, um, because of apartheid era uh, ge geography, most black people will, would live in former black areas. So some of the better schools are located in former white areas. So once you imply a 30 kilometer radius, uh, it gives a greater access to non-white children to enter those, um, those good schools and I place it in inverted commas because it's not always good school just because they are uh, former white schools. So, so that is the dis discrepancy um, at the moment in terms of the zoning regulations. I am of the view that um, it's actually a potential court case that there is this discrepancy between the provinces, um, but that matter has not been taken up um, uh, at, in, in a court case. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions? Daniel, is there anybody on Zoom? No. Nosipo looks like she has a question. Nosipo, do you have a question? No, you can ask Nosipo. Nosipo? <laughs> I can see that she has Nosipo a question. doesn't have to raise her hand or face it. <laughs> she has a question. Um, thank you for your presentation. I'm Nosipo Ngomezulu from where am I? University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. So, oh, education, right? Um, I'm really curious about like this tension between 
what happens in South Africa where if you've got any kind of progressive politic mm -hmm. or even counter state politic, um, you're often accused of like trying to legislate through the courts. So you mm -hmm. run to the constitutional court in order to kind of have a back door into mm. getting what you want, right? Whether it's seen as progressive or mm. regressive. So I'd like to hear what you make of kind of like institutions like Section 27 mm. and NGOs who go in to appeal to the courts mm. to make what is seen as kind of like a more progressive kind of politic. Mm. Um, because I think there's something interesting that play between like those institutions who legislate through the courts mm. and also this very tricky situation of like people wanting to run their schools and their communities the way they want. Mm. And so how, how, how do you square this and how do you understand this? Because I mean, obviously, mm. ideally people are down with a more progressive, mm. non-racist South Africa, mm. but a lot of people aren't. And so how, how do you square that circle or how do you think about it in your work? Because I think it is a sticky tension. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm actually not so happy that I, that I asked you to ask the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, so section uh, organizations such as Section 27 and Equal Education, um, I've actually critiqued um, their approach um, in my thesis, uh, in my PhD thesis. So, um, and that is where this narrow conceptualization of inequality comes in. Because I think they have, um, of, of, of course, the, the, the discrepancy in resources between former white and former black schools, it, it's vast, right? Um, but they tend to have um, overly focused on resources. Um, and most of these cases that go to court then centers around the fact that government is not delivering resources to black schools. And they center the, the, the inequality argument around that. Um, but I think that has to be broadened. That has to be broadened because um, inequality is not, does not merely manifest, manifest through resources. It's also about what is playing out in our schools in terms of the institutional cultures in our schools, um, the curriculum itself, um, that really that what is underpinning um, um, institutional cultures in South African school, schools are a very Eurocentric paradigm. Um, and the Department of Basic Education has conceded that that is a problem and that we should be de decolonizing. But because of the popularity of the civil society organizations and the focus on resources, that argument seemed to be getting lost. Um, and so I would like them to focus more on what is also happening, especially in former white schools, where black learners are forced to assimilate in a specific culture, in a white Eurocentric uh, culture. Uh, black children are traumatized by the racism in those schools, but these are not the issues that that the focus in, is on. It's, and, and so the agenda that is being pushed is only on resources. Um, so that is where I, I criticize these social, uh, these uh, civil society organizations. So we have time for one last short question. Gifty. Gifty. Give the your hand was first, you get the question. Okay, thanks for your presentation, it was um, really insightful. I know your work is on um, the governing bodies, but I also want to ask about um, fees. School right? fees? Yes. yes, so if the um, school has their own policy, then they can decide the fees they take, am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Have you looked into them using fees as a way of um, differentiating mm. or employing whites and then blacks? Okay, so uh, I did, did look at fees in, for my master's thesis, actually. So, um, so in, in, in South Africa, some school, so form, so schools are divided into quintiles, um, schools in areas, um, 
So your, mostly your former white schools would be fee charging schools, so they can charge school fees. About 70% of South African schools have been exempted from school fees. So, and these are mostly your uh, former black schools, so they're not required to pay, to pay school fees. Um, so what is happening is that although learners in, in, in black, former black schools, they don't pay any school fees, um, technically, theoretically, they get a larger cut of the edu education budget from government, but because the, um, the lack of resources, the, 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 the resource um, uh, constraints are so uh, vast in former black schools, um, most of the money, most of government's budget goes into um, rectifying that particular situation. In schools such as the former white schools where they can charge school fees, they technically get a, a smaller percentage of the budget, but they charge high amount of school fees. So they are already um, privileged in the sense that they have adequate resources, but because they get, they can charge school fees, um, they can, for example, employ more additional teachers. Um, so uh, uh, children are subject, for example, to private lessons. They have better facilities and so on. So you have this inequality merely being perpetuated. Although in theory, uh, um, in, in former black schools, there's no fees being charged. But, but you, um, I invite you to, you can read my uh, master's thesis where I go into much more detail on that particular topic. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. And that's always a good way to answer a question. So I read my thesis. <laughs> Thank you, um, Thank, you. Thank you. There is. So our next presenter this afternoon is Sevias Guvuriro, who comes to us from University of Free State, also in South Africa, and your University of Michigan. Sevias works with Professor Aaron Krupka from the School of Information. Sevias. Okay, um, good afternoon to you all and to those who are joining us virtually. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever applies to you. Okay, um, so my talk today is actually part of a bigger project that we are doing in a poor community in South Africa. Um, and the project focuses on the economic and social preferences and their health behaviors among the young adults. Um, it is quite important for us to worry about the youngsters' intentions and willingnesses to engage in risky or protective health-related uh, behaviors because that actually influences their uh, health at a later stage in life, right? Uh, and so our quest in our uh, project is to see how best we can actually influence um, these intentions and willingnesses uh, to engage uh, uh, in these uh, risky or protective health-related behaviors uh, at an early stage of life. Okay. So, uh, my presentation is going to follow a conventional approach. I will start with the introduction, and it's going to be very brief. Talk a little bit about alcohol use, what we know in terms of the research, the research questions uh, that we are trying to answer, the subjects that we have in our project, um, and the instruments that we are actually using, and the measures we can actually draw from those instruments. Uh, and the kind of analysis that we have done so far. And then I will share the preliminary results. And then after that, I will uh, give you the uh, takeaways. And my, I must say upfront, uh, this is actually work in progress. So your comments and suggestions at the end of the session will actually uh, play an important role. Okay, just to give uh, a quick introduction. 
Collectively, non-communicable diseases have become the leading killers of humans across the world, all right? I am talking about, you know, the cardiovascular diseases, uh, such as the heart attacks, um, uh, the strokes, um, the chronic, um, chronic um, um, diseases as well, respiratory ones. Uh, those have actually contributed or have claimed, or they actually claim 41 million lives every year, right? And these deaths, most of them are actually happening prematurely. We are talking of like 15 million of people who are losing their lives between the age of 30 to 69, right? And the other important aspect that I must mention, they are disproportionately impacting the developing countries, all right? About three quarters of the 41 million that I'm talking about, it's actually in the developing uh, 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 countries, all right? And if I'm to zoom into South Africa, um, you would find that um, these non-communicable diseases, they are actually one of the major component of the country's quadruple burden of disease. And the harmful use of alcohol is among the five main non-communicable diseases risk factors in the world, right? And we see that also in South Africa. So our study basically, and the talk that I'm gonna focus on today, looks at you know, how we can actually reduce the abuse of alcohol in the, uh, among the youth that are in South Africa. All right, okay. So what do we have or what do we know with respect to alcohol use? The World Health Organization is what it calls the uh, uh, best buys uh, interventions on alcohol use, right? And these best buys, there are three of them, increasing excise taxes, or enacting and enforcing restrictions on exposure to alcohol advertising, or enacting and enforcing restrictions on the physical availability of alcohol in sales outlets. However, we are arguing that there's actually a possible miss there, and this is the miss on the fact that the lifestyle behaviors in early life are very important drivers of these chronic diseases. But not only that, the best buys that we are talking about, or that the World Health Organization talks about, are actually uh, overlooking unique contextual factors in developing countries, such as the fact that not every alcoholic drink can be taxed or controlled by restrictions in terms of physical availability, right? And many, in, in many of the developing countries also, we see the informal settlements where, again, uh, the regulation with respect to alcohol is close to a nightmare, right? So we are arguing that understanding uh, the broad drivers of intentions and willingness to engage uh, in risky or protective health related behaviors may actually help us or inform us to establish what we call the persuasive behavior change approach, which can actually be useful in as far as this subject is concerned. Okay, so um, what is it that we know in, that we find in literature with, the with respect to alcohol use? I can say there are three discernible strands in, in the literature. One is on, uh, on the theories, so the, 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 the psychologists have done a very good job. We have a number of theories, such as the alcohol expectance theory, the cognitive model of binge drinking, and the theory of reasoned action. That helps to explain the alcohol consumption. But we also have studies that focus on the biopsychosocial factors. I'm talking about factors such as the genetic susceptibility to alcoholism, as well as the social contextual factors relating to family environment. And there are also studies that focus on the construction of drinking identities, right? And these are identities based on gender. And in today's age with the digital technologies, we see, you know, the construction of identities relating to drinking as well. However, they, these studies are predominantly in advanced economies. We don't see a lot of literature which actually covers the developing countries. That's number one. Number two, there is actually no literature on the influence of the risk appetite and 
uh, uh, impatience on behavioral intentions and behavioral willingness to engage in hazardous drinking. And that is where we are uh, trying to, 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 to concentrate on and make a contribution there. Okay, so specifically then our aim is to try and conduct a test of the prototype willingness model for hazardous drinking, including the extent to which intentions and willingness uh, to drink are uh, influencing um, uh, uh, the engagement in drinking. Okay, and then the research questions we have are, there are three research questions that we have, the applicability of prototype willingness model, and whether risk appetite and impatience actually influence the intention to engage in hazardous uh, uh, drinking. Okay, the participants we have in our study, we actually uh, have like 240 uh, young adults, and these young adults, we actually um, surveyed them in an informal settlement in Bloemfontein, right? And we purposefully recruited them. And uh, the other important aspect is that they are within the age of 18 to 24, all right? And the main reason why we are focusing on the age 18 to 24 is because they are just emerging from adolescence. And so these young adults' self-image is still under construction. And so their behavior is so much susceptible to that of the people around them, be it you know, friends, family, peers, and even the social environment that they are operating in. And of course, uh, in a situation where we have more than two, we would use a Kish grid, but I'm not gonna uh, spend a lot of time on that. And, um, and the other aspect is that, of course, the project got uh, an ethics approval. And so all our interviews, we did that after obtaining an informed consent from the participants. So in terms of the instruments, right, there are three important instruments that we actually used. Uh, we have the instruments that measures the economic and social preferences, and this is actually the streamlined version of the World Economic Social Preference Survey module, which is actually validated. And the second uh, instrument is the survey module on drinking behavior. And then we also have the three item measure, uh, 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 item measure of uh, alcohol use, which is called the, item, the three item alcohol use disorders identification test. So this one actually focuses on the drinking frequency, the uh, typical quantity of standard alcohol drinks, as well as the frequency of heavy drinking, which they sometimes refer to as the heavy episodic uh, 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 drinking. All right. And what are the measures that we have? So from these instruments, we, the important measures we have, uh, they look at the hazardous drinking as a binary variable, actually. It's either you engage in hazardous drinking or you not. And then there are the other you know, variables that actually speak to the theory of planned behavior as well as the, uh, uh, the prototype willingness model. So I'm going to talk briefly about those uh, other factors. For example, the attitude. I am, we are talking about you know, a person's evaluation of behavior. So how do you evaluate the behavior of drinking, for example, of, of binge drinking, right? And then when we talk of subjective norms, we are saying what kind of pressure do the people import, that are important to you impose with respect to the specific behavior? And when it, we talk of descriptive norms, we are saying what do actually the people uh, what are the other people actually do with respect to that particular behavior? And of course, your degree of control, which is the perceived behavioral control. And then we have the prototypes. The prototypes we are talking about, uh, how your degree of liking of someone who actually engages in a specific uh, behavior. In this case, it's in the drinking, drinking behavior. As well as your similarity, how are you going to gauge in terms of uh, 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 you're similar to the person who again engages in that particular uh, 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 behavior. So those are the key important uh, measures, but from the prototype willingness model, as well as the theory of planned behavior. But we also have the other two important ones, which I'm gonna zoom on, which is the one for risk um, uh, 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 appetite. And when we talk of risk appetite, we are saying how risk taking are you? Uh, or how risk averse are you? 
And when we talk of impatience, we are saying, how future-oriented are you, or how present-oriented are you? And we are arguing, or we are of the opinion that the risk averseness uh, or, or risk-taking behavior, as well as the impatience, may actually influence your intentions, as well as your willingness to engage in uh, drinking uh, behavior. Okay, so the, the, while is the whole model looks like that, where um, that is the one that we did run, I'm not gonna bother you with the whole model. I will go straight to the issues that are important. So th that, the, all those components that are in red, the literature has uh, uh, actually uh, explored that information. In other words, that is actually representing the theory of planned behavior. And the one that I've added again, which is in blue, we already have that again in literature. That is actually the prototype willingness model, okay? But where we are adding, we are contributing by adding the risk appetite and the patience, hypothesizing that risk appetite can actually influence the attitudes as well as the behavior intentions. And the patience can also affect attitudes, behavior intentions, behavior willingness, as well as the prototype variability. So, that's where we are actually making our uh, uh, contribution. And by the way, we are actually exploring this in a unique setting of an informal settlement in a developing country, right? Which is actually uh, South Africa. Okay, um, this is just a summary of the demographic characteristics of our participants. Of course, their average age is about 21. And many of them are not yet married. I can see you seen there's about 80% of them. And again, they have an education of about, uh, of just some secondary or grade 12. We see there's a contribution of about 90% there. And many of them are actually unemployed, as you can see from uh, the 73% that is below, or that is, that is shown on the, the last row. Okay. What is all uh, the results for the whole uh, uh, model looks like that, and they are sort of like upholding the prototype willingness model. I am going to concentrate on uh, where we are actually making our contribution, which is that of the risk appetite as well as the patience. And what I am showing there is the fact that your risk appetite has a positive association with your attitude towards a behavior. And your attitude towards your behavior will actually influence your behavioral intentions to engage in that particular behavior, which will then lead, lead you to actually engage in that specific behavior. And we are also seeing that the risk appetite has a positive relationship with the prototype variability, which influences the behavior through the behavioral willingness, right? That's in as far as the risk appetite is concerned. When we look at the impatience, we are also seeing that those that are very impatient, they tend to have a positive relationship with the attitude towards the behavior, which, as I said, will influence the behavior through the behavioral intention. But we see the patients influencing uh, the behavioral intentions directly as well as well as via the prototype, all right? So what are the takeaways from what I have just discussed here? And I, I'm sure that is what is very important for, for many of you, okay? The, it's clear that the prototype willingness model shows significant drivers of hazardous drinking in form of the attitudes, uh, the perceived behavioral control, as well as the prototypes and the immediate predicting factors of a behavior such as the intention and willingness, right? And the other aspect is that for our young adults, for our young adults in South Africa, their risk appetite associates with their attitude towards hazardous drinking positively. Again, it associates with their, uh, uh, they actually view those that drink alcohol favorably. And with respect to their impatience, again, impatience, impatience in young adults associates with positive attitude towards drinking and high intention to engage in hazardous drinking. Again, impatient young adults favorably evaluate 
alcohol drinkers, and they have a high willingness to engage in hazardous uh, uh, drinking. And lastly, this is happening in the early adulthood, which basically means that we have the opportunity to implement uh, interventions that can impact young adults' risk appetite and patients, and in turn, influence their alcohol use as a risk health-related behavior, all right? In terms of the conclusion, um, we have explored or we have used the prototype willingness model uh, in order to assess the, the intentions and willingness to engage in hazardous drinking. And we added or we have seen the risk appetite and patients raw in this particular uh, program, right? So our question was really on the applicability and you know, the influence of risk appetite as well as patients, right? And we have upheld the prototype willingness model. Again, risk appetite and patients among young adults can be linked to hazardous drinking. So in other words, addressing hazardous drinking among young adults requires interventions that include influencing their risk appetite and patients, among other things. Again, reducing risk drinking behavior has significant gains of lives saved, uh, of lives saved quality adjusted life years uh, gained, as well as the economic, in, in terms of the economic terms, all right? I'm almost there. How am I doing in terms of time? I'm sure I'm great. Okay, I, 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 I would not have done a good job if I don't extend my gratitude to the following, all right? Of course, my host here at the University of the, the, the Michigan, uh, Prof. Erin Krupka, uh, she, I always enjoyed our meetings, our engagement, and you know, the ideas that she always throws you know, to me, right? Of course, the African Studies Center, the whole team, and the, the University of Michigan itself. Uh, my collaborator at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, Prof. Boysen. Uh, my home university. And of course, the guys in my department. I thank you so much uh, for your support. Uh, my cohorts who are here. And of course, the most beautiful people in my life. My, my, my wife, Vivian, and my two boys, Tabonga and Akudzwe. I miss you so much, guys, but yes, Daddy is coming. Thank you so much for persevering my absence in your life. Thank you. Thank you, Sevias. OK, let me remind the guys as well. I, I don't want questions and answers as I'm saying there. I think I want comments and suggestions. You can go ahead and ask questions. It's OK. Well, since, since I run this, I'll say <laughs> questions are allowed. So, um, yes. Um, Peter, and then Purity, and then Pierre. OK, um, my name is Peter Oviro. Um, I'm a fellow from the University of Johannesburg. Thank you, Sylvia, for that good talk, okay. enlightening. Um, I just want, probably, I would need more clarity from your, from the data, you from the data, collection yeah you said like s most of the people most of the people there are not employed yes yeah is there a link between unemployment and drink and the drinking attitude and if there's a link from my basic understanding you need money to buy this alcohol right, right. correct so i don't understand can you just probably give more clarity as regards that yeah sure um so you are quite right to say many of actually our participants in as far as our data is concerned they are actually unemployed and uh, it is true to say you should have economic power for you to be able to buy beer uh, but that's again one of the issues that i raised to say when you look at what we call what the world health organization consider as the best buys they may not actually be applicable in some of the developing countries. And the reason being that not everything that is alcoholic can actually be controlled. Uh, uh, uh. And so what these guys do, much as they may not get money every day, but when they do, 
they can do what is called heavy episodic drinking. And again, heavy episodic drinking can be quite detrimental to their health. Not just that, they may not get the money for other things, but they can actually engage in many other things to get money for drinking. The main reason why we think uh, driving or influencing their willingness and their intentions towards this risky health-related behavior may be better than actually thinking about these enacted controls from the government. So yes, I agree with you, they are unemployed, but many of them, when they do drink, they engage in heavy episodic drinking. Okay. And yes, it's true. In actual fact, it's just showing uh, as we are talking about uh, 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 a poor community, an informal settlement in an urban city, and with that high level of unemployment, we, I'm sure you know the unemployment rate in South Africa as well. Not just for, for, the, for the great corps, even for the graduates. The numbers are scary. It shocks me when I walk around here and they have these, we are hiring. I wonder how <laughs> and what will happen in South Africa if we, if we happen to have such, a, such an advert of saying we are hiring. <laughs> I'm just so. <laughs> Thank you. Purity. Uh, thank you, Saviors, for your work. My name is Purity from Kenyatta University in Nairobi, in Nairobi Kenya. And um, I would want to say that this is quite um, a, a, a brilliant study and, and very timely uh, because uh, this is a topical issue. Uh, even in Kenya, we, we still have the same challenge. And of course, as you you see that uh, <coughs> the legal mechanisms of controlling alcohol use have almost failed. And so we need other mechanisms, or we need other strategies, and yeah. this presents to, uh, to me as one of it. And uh, a follow-up of what Peter was asking, um, I almost feel like we need a, a control for some of your variables because when we are looking at other factors that may influence alcoholism, like they have said employment and many other factors that we are aware of, mm. we, we probably would have wanted uh, control variables, and that would have probably come in very well with your methodology, your sampling okay. methodology. You said you, you did per passive, which mm. probably may not be very ideal for us to control. Yeah? Okay. I, I don't know how Papa yeah, yeah, yeah. this I can, was I can in, take in, that question. A, in an and, informal and, setup. And, yeah, I can take that question. Is the oh, do you have another question? Uh, yeah, that that is it. But I also wanted to know what is your contribution to the model that, okay, that you're great. using. So the first part is uh, you need controls in in this particular you know model that we are running. That's your first question. And surely, if I started talking about the controls here then I would have confused or confused so many people. So I decided to just focus on what actually can trigger the discussion that we're having right now. But the generalized structural equation modeling allows me to actually control for, for those things. So in terms of my actual variable, I mean my actual model, I have controlled for some of those, uh, uh, for those factors. And your second question was, um, what is my, my contribution? So like I said, uh, I think I shared, I shared with you three slides. The first one was talking about the, uh, uh, the, the theory of planned behavior. The second one was talking about the prototype willingness model. But these models do not have uh, the risk or the economic preferences. I'm talking about the risk appetite as well as the impatience, right? So we are adding the impatience as well as the patience in the model. So that's what we are claiming to be our contribution. We are trying to contribute in that regard. Thank you, Pierre. Hey, come on. Is it was it serious? How, how come there are so many questions now? These guys told me they are going to fire me with so Hold many questions. <laughs> it's nice. Go ahead. We'll be done soon. Uh, thanks, Sevias, for the presentation. And uh, it really catches all our attention, I think. Um, let me start by uh, giving something as a, like uh, for laughing. 
some of uh, the students around here told me, the graduate students, they told me that uh, because of the law, the regulation in USA about drinking, uh, uh, is it age limit? Yeah, like yeah. It's, yes, I think it's 21, yes. yeah, you yeah. should yeah. drink from 20, 21. Yeah, so yeah. some of the students who are 20 or who are 19, they do what? They tend to organize uh, some sort of uh, uh, vacation. They yeah. go for yeah. uh, travel yeah. close to Canada so as they can enter Canada, okay. where the age limit is 18. Yeah. So when they get there, yeah. they can consume as much as they can yeah. and then come back to USA and okay. abide to the, to the rule. So, <laughs> okay, so putting that in the brackets mm. and uh, according to what you just explained mm. about the age mm. and especially the vulnerable yeah. uh, age for yeah. uh, alcohol uh, yeah. and its uh, effect. Mm. Um, do you think uh, the idea of uh, sampling from uh, one space and uh, um, getting to the significance of uh, what you are showing us, yeah. it's really consistent or you think that uh, one can sample at uh, maybe 10 locations in order for you to get an average yeah. uh, type of uh, result. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, also with youngsters, it's a bit tricky because some, they tend to do anything after taking drugs. Let's take the case of South Africa because mm -hmm. of unemployment yeah. and what. Yes. Yeah. I've, uh, I've encountered, I live in South Africa, so mm -hmm. I can talk uh, about South Africa. So I've encountered at uh, many occasions yeah. some uh, students, some uh, kids from high school. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of going to school, they sit somewhere in the park, mm. they buy uh, like a mixture of, uh, <laughs> of medication yeah. and they make drugs. Yeah. And from there on, they can buy anything else, drinking mm. and... Yeah. Uh, yeah. All yeah. those things. So yeah. I don't know if you have uh, all those things in, into consideration, like all those uh, fact factors. And uh, beside that, now, how would you now try to kind of uh, check your sampling from one space to another and make to mm. the consistent yeah. uh, significance yeah. uh, of your result? Yeah, yeah I'm, that's I'm, my question. I'm so excited, you know, when you are talking because I see how much you actually value uh, uh, my research and its importance in the South African context. You are even, you know, contributing in form of, you know, other issues that we have to, to, to look at. For example, it is not just the alcohol, right? There are other, you know, substances that can actually intoxicate them. So how do we reach out to those, not just those that are 18 and above, Okay, why did we select the 18 to 24? And why did we work with only one particular sample? It was purely the budgetary, budgetary constraints. But the resources permitting, which is something that I'm working on right now, and see if I can get you know, some funding and be able to expand it, it cannot just be only for Bloemfontein. And then we, we say, oh, this is what we found, therefore it's South Africa. At this stage, we cannot generalize that we will only be able to generalize our results after we have actually expanded it to other regions or to other cities. But it's not a hidden secret that in each and every city in South Africa, we have an informal settlement. In actual fact, uh, in terms of the urge, we could have actually included those that are below 80. But according to the ethics, you know, uh, in South Africa, those that are 18 and above, they can consent to participate, okay? in a study. If they are below 18, then you need an assent from the parents. And so the processes of all doing all that were definitely going to, 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 to take us a lot of time. But it doesn't mean, therefore, we do. Actually, the adolescents, we also want to target them. All right? So, so I agree with you. I hope I've answered your questions. No, no, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, so I see Kim has his hand up. That's the last short question. Okay. Daniel is right behind you. Yeah, no questions. We'll make it short for you. So, all right, I'm, <coughs> I'm Cam Kumba, and part of the uh, ASC here at U of M. So maybe I'll take a little different twist uh, on, on what you're studying. It sounds to me like uh, many of the social problems that one comes across. Have you looked at the role of the alcohol industry itself and governments? Because there's a tendency to push problems on the poor and then study the poor as though they are the problem. <laughs> so there's the whole industry, the advertisement, the profit making. I'm originally from the Cameroons. Yeah. So, and when you look at when we tend to quote problems being prevalent 
in the developing countries? Could that also be because there are more numbers down, down there? Absolute numbers, not because there are more problems there, but just because the bulk of the global population is in the south, in the, in the developing countries. So maybe uh, the proportion, you know, the statistics and the absolute numbers. So 1% of China is a few million. 1% of, 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 uh, of uh, say Nigeria is about 20 million. 1% of Cameroon is much less. So when you say the numbers are more in the south, could it just be because the pyramid bulges are in, in the south? That's one thing to look at. But also more specifically, the role of government and the industry itself in making alcoholics of its population and then studying them as a problem. Yes, and you, you are quite right, uh, particularly with respect to the role of government and uh, the, 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 the companies that actually produce alcohol. Uh, it's an area that requires serious attention. I will take you back to 2020 and 2021 you know, at the peak of the lockdown, okay? At the peak of the lockdown, uh, when beer was not supposed to move, you would find people in the informal settlement still drinking beer and bottled beer, right? So there is this element of being driven by profits and not considering what is actually legal to do. So I agree with you that perhaps the government has to do more uh, uh, with respect to that aspect, but also the companies actually that actually produce alcohol as well, they have a role to play. But remember, that's why I indicated those three bullets uh, which talk about taxes, increasing tax. Should we increase tax? But Pierre has already indicated that you may choose to increase tax on alcohol, they can make their own alcohol. They can actually make their, which can be even worse than, than what they can buy from the, from, from, from the bottle stores and the like. So what is actually needed would be the persuasive behavior change approach. Where we reach out to the partakers, those who actually young as they are. Uh, it's, I thought, you know, this is also not happening in America, but you have already indicated that the Americans, they will travel to Detroit and jump into Canada and start drinking as much as they can. I, I, because I'm seeing when I walk around, they are so much behaving and they are very good. I thought they will not do that. I hope I've answered you, sir. So we're unfortunately out of time, sorry, Ken. We're, we're out of time, I'm really sorry, otherwise we will run too late. <laughs> but really but it's not me who took the time. It's not you, no, 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 Thank no. Thank you. No. And I want, to, I want to mention one thing, right? You said you interviewed 240 participants yeah, and it yeah, takes yeah. about an hour For per an participant. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of work. So we can't ask him to, you know, run the study elsewhere also. <laughs> yeah, but if, but if I get the money, I would love to. And I'm searching for money, by the way, so yeah. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Sebias. Thank you so much. Okay, our last presenter today is Laston Manja from University of Malawi. And here at Michigan, Laston works with Professor Dean Yang from the Department of Economics and the um, School of Public Policy. Laston. Thank you. Right, um, thank you. I hope uh, you're able to, to hear me. Um, again, thank you very much for uh, your time. Uh, my name is Laston, and uh, I am working on this uh, study. So basically, I will be making a presentation uh, titled Payment Delays for Cash Transfers, the Role of uh, Subsistence Constraints. I must mention that uh, this is a slight uh, modification to uh, the topic that I had submitted and uh, the topic you might have seen out there. I guess uh, that's just a sign of, uh, uh, just signals how much progress we are making every day. Uh, but uh, yeah, in this presentation, I uh, will mainly focus on the motivation. And then having taken you through the motivation, I will just quickly go through the methods 
and then the results uh, that uh, I have uh, this far. Uh, the main issue or the central issue that I am dealing with or researching on in this study is cash transfers. We are all familiar with uh, cash transfers or as we uh, usually see them, more specifically social cash transfers. So uh, uh, almost each and every country does have uh, these transfers. But uh, just to mention that uh, these cash transfers are a fairly recent uh, tool, so uh, they are uh, actually a new instrument of development policy. Uh, historically, specifically talking about uh, developing as well as emerging countries or economies, uh, they have mainly uh, become more prominent since the mid-1990s after a few countries, particularly Brazil, uh, Mexico, and South Africa, were uh, keen to develop tools or social protection policies that would be more inclusive. So they just wanted to come up with uh, social protection policies that would cater for both the formal side and the informal side uh, within their economies. And of course, uh, due to the success that these uh, countries recorded, uh, eventually around the early 2000s, uh, different governments came to employ uh, these uh, transfers uh, to, to uh, a wide uh, extent. And of course, we've seen international organizations, including the World Bank, uh, the International Labor Organization, uh, uh, basically uh, also trying to uh, be at the forefront in as far as implementation of these is concerned. So they will be implemented by governments, NGOs, and all these uh, different international uh, organizations. Okay, uh, also just to mention that, uh, uh, so we now have, each and every country does have millions of people depending on uh, these transfers, and of course governments also devoting significant amounts of uh, their budgets to uh, these transfers. They are used in different con uh, contexts. So for example, we do have governments implementing transfers uh, in the provision for refugees, for example. Transfers will be there when uh, they are uh, the government is trying to basically introduce in, uh, uh, interventions in disaster relief, or more generally just to tackle poverty uh, when you talk about uh, developing uh, countries. So they are widely used, they are heavily used uh, within uh, our economies. Uh, broadly, cash transfers, uh, so a lot of research has been done, there is a whole lot of literature on the impacts of uh, cash transfers, basically just impact evaluations uh, on these. Uh, and of course, uh, they have been found uh, to have positive impacts from so many angles. So they will have positive impacts in health, in education. They do have positive impacts in nutrition, even as far as empowerment. For example, women empowerment and uh, various other issues. We uh, have uh, now, we do have research that shows uh, that uh, these transfers are beneficial in as far as uh, this is um, actually uh, concerned. But one critical issue or one critical question uh, that uh, development practitioners, as well as the academia, is really is struggling to uh, answer at the moment is uh, how these recipients may be motivated to save. So how do we motivate uh, these recipients of uh, cash transfers to save? Uh, and of course, just to mention that saving is a big problem, especially in the developing and uh, emerging countries. So just uh, to bring things to light, uh, only about 20% of adults in uh, uh, low-income countries uh, save with a formal institution compared to uh, at least 50% within uh, the high-income countries. So more broadly speaking, save, saving is uh, quite low within uh, this context. Yet there is so much research that's been done and has shown that saving is actually good for welfare. So this is one of the questions uh, that's uh, being uh, uh, out there and uh, uh, people are trying to answer. Now, uh, the issue of saving can be looked at from different angles. So if you're trying to get people to save, there are so many things you could actually propose. So for example, we have seen interventions that basically work on the supply side. So basically just try to uh, motivate banks or financial institutions uh, to have attractive uh, uh, financial products. So for example, maybe you want them to have products with a higher interest rate. So if somebody goes to save, they gain more. We have seen interventions on the demand side. So for example, we have seen interventions where uh, governments implement uh, or try to improve financial literacy. So basically people should understand what products are out there just to get them to save. So, so many things can be looked at, but of particular interest in this study is psychological factors. So just trying to understand 
uh, the feelings, the emotions, and all those uh, psychological factors uh, that could be motivating uh, individuals in as far as behavior, particularly saving behavior, is concerned. And of course, when we talk about psychological factors within economics, we mainly refer to a subfield known as behavioral economics. So uh, you, you could be familiar with uh, behavioral economics. Some of you la love to read. So you could have read most likely free economics. Or you listen to podcasts, you might have uh, come across free economics. You might have read Nudge. Uh, you might have read Blink. And so many other interesting uh, books uh, that are out there. This is really just within this interesting field we call behavioral economics. OK, uh, so just if somebody is interested, within behavioral economics, we are basically just trying to put a pause on the mainstream assumption we make within economics. So within economics, you will assume that individuals are rational. So they make the best decisions. They keep their self-interest at heart. But of course, we will always observe all these different behaviors. For example, Sylvius is talking about uh, this excessive drinking and uh, stuff. So within behavioral economics, we put a pause to that assumption and just try to understand the psychological factors behind uh, these uh, different uh, behaviors uh, that we do observe. Now, getting back to the issue about saving, what does behavior economics say about saving? So within behavior economics, we do have a phenomenon that's quite interesting, um, formerly known as uh, the theory of mental accounting. So this theory basically says if you want people to save, particularly from these cash transfers, it is best to give these transfers with a delay. So you have to give, you don't give the transfers right away or immediately, but maybe give it a delay. Tell them you will be getting this amount uh, after such, such a period. And then uh, according to this uh, uh, phenomenon, these people will be able to save. Uh, intuitively, we are just saying these individuals with that much time will be able to properly plan. So if uh, you were told that you will get $100,000 in a week, you'll probably be able to plan, and then you, you allocate all those amounts. Particularly, this theory argues that individuals who allocate to current consumption, so they mentally create accounts. So from the 100,000, I could say a 20,000 will go to current consumption. So maybe I'm just basically buying food or whatever I want now. Uh, uh, and then I will allocate some amount to current assets. Maybe I buy assets that I can use from now going forward. And then I will allocate some of that money into the future. So the future uh, account. And this is really quite impressive. I mean, uh, most likely all of us will be thinking within those uh, accounts. Uh, but uh, of course, the key question uh, that I am asking in this study is, uh, does somebody who is wealthy think in the same way as somebody who is poor? So imagine somebody who is basically just trying to survive. They just want to get to the next day. Uh, the, uh, the, one of the uh, problems that I, I, I find with this theory is uh, it doesn't cater for that. Those differences in as far as uh, the kind of thinking between wealthy and poor individuals is concerned. So basically, this is where I introduce the concept of uh, subsistence constraints. So the theory assumes that universality, that things will apply for both wealthy and poor individuals. Uh, but uh, then things uh, could be different. Maybe the poor won't be thinking about uh, the future account and, and so on and so forth. OK, so having uh, assumed that I have uh, successfully motivated uh, the study, this is just to take you through uh, the objectives, some of the key objectives uh, that uh, uh, are within this study. So first of all, uh, the task is uh, to theoretically modify. So just to propose a theoretical modification, a theoretical modification of uh, uh, basically this mental accounting theory to take into account the subsistence constraints or basically this difference between wealthy and poor individuals. So just to have that uh, within uh, the theory. So that's the first objective. The second one is to just empirically test the proposed modification. So use data and test all of that. And of course, uh, the first objective is a little more theoretical and a little mathematical, and, and therefore not very interesting, especially for uh, this presentation. So for this presentation, I will mainly just focus on the second objective. So basically, where we use data to just test this modification. OK. Um, so 
So this is now just uh, the key methods that uh, I use. So particularly talking about the data, I don't go to collect data, I use already existing data. So this is data that was collected from a field experiment, a randomized control trial that was implemented by uh, Brun, Jean, Godbeck, and Young. Uh, so I'm basically just, uh, uh, so their goal was to understand saving and consumption decisions, particularly uh, consumption decisions, and then there was a follow-up study that focused on the savings decisions, particularly just tested uh, the theory of mental accounting using the same data. And I am coming forward uh, to go on and uh, introduce these subsistence constraints using uh, that uh, uh, same uh, data. And of course, uh, just to quickly talk about the intervention or what they do in the experiment. So they have a group of people who serve as the control group. These people get uh, a cash transfer immediately. And there is a group of people that gets the cash transfer with delays. So particularly there would be the one day delay and the eight day delay. But let's just say getting it immediately and getting it with a delay. And then just to see after some time how much these groups of people are able to save. So that's basically what the experiment uh, was trying to do. I am very happy that this experiment was conducted in Malawi, uh, back home, uh, coincidentally, I should mention. Uh, so this was conducted through a local commercial bank uh, uh, in Malawi, particularly in a district we call Mulanje. And uh, uh, just to quickly show uh, you the location of Mulanje. I mean, this is still work in progress, uh, this map and everything. Uh, but uh, basically, this is towards the southern part where we do have Mozambique uh, down here, towards uh, the southern border. Uh, right, uh, so just again, just to maybe to talk about the context, Mulanje is a really beautiful small town, uh, that side. It happens to be the central, uh, the center of uh, the tea industry of Malawi. So tea is one of uh, the key exports that we try to, uh, ex uh, to, to do, of course, after our counterparts, Kenya. But, uh, but yeah, we also try to do some tea. And uh, if you would love to do some traveling, maybe if, or if you ever come to Mulanje and you love the mountainside, Mulanje is, uh, if you come to Malawi, Mulanje will be one of uh, the districts you definitely want to uh, come to. Okay, maybe I have done enough advertising uh, uh, in that line. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so this is basically what we, uh, what we have uh, in terms of uh, the methods. I have tried to just simplify what was happening within the experiment. Now I can quickly just take you through the results uh, that we have as of now. As I mentioned, I am using already existing data. Uh, and of course, uh, so we have, I have two studies before me that use the same data. Uh, and, uh, and one of the studies basically just tried to uh, answer this question or to basically just test the theory of mental accounting. Does it work? Does delaying a payment improve savings? So that's uh, the question uh, that one of the studies was trying to answer. I just reproduced the results here. But indeed, delaying a payment was found to improve savings. Savings as defined in multiple ways. So for example, given this is a local context, we want to include in-kind savings. So in-kind savings will be savings, for example, a household will have if they decide to buy in advance a bag of fertilizer. So most of these are farming households. They will sometimes just buy a bag of fertilizer or a bag of maize, whatever. So that comes under in-kind savings. And for in-kind savings, the group that got a payment delay, so this uh, darker bar just shows uh, the average level of savings for the group that got a payment delay. So this uh, savings or the level of savings for uh, that group with a payment delay, what I'm calling the treated, is higher than the level of savings for those who are in the control group who got the payment immediately. And of course, we also observe the differences. These are just averages. I also observe the differences for financial savings. So maybe how much do people save in the bank? Or, so that's formal savings. Even informal savings, um, how much do you save under the pillow? Or how much do you, do you at least report to save under the pillow? So again, the level of savings is higher for those that got a payment delay than those that did not. And again, in total, just total savings, everything that's reported, also higher for those that got uh, these with a delay. So this is a result that was also fine. I just reproduce it in terms of uh, uh, these averages. Now, the key question that I am asking in this case is the role of subsistence constraints. So how do subsistence constraints, so how does this work uh, for the poor and for the rich? Does it, for example, do the payment delays 
have the same or affect savings in the same way between uh, these uh, two groups. Again, I just try to uh, show this graph. So down here on what people call the x-axis, I am just looking at uh, the level of wealth. So as we go to the, to the right, we are looking at wealthier individuals. So those on the left, for example, D2, will be, uh, so that will be a poor household uh, on the extreme end, and uh, this will be a richer household or a wealthier house household. And of course, these bars, again, are just showing the impact that the delay has for this particular group. So these will just be deciles. So for example, those who are wealthiest uh, show a higher impact. So the, the payment delay is actually more effective for wealthier individuals. So it helps wealthier individuals save more than it helps poorer individuals. And I think that's uh, uh, quite reasonable. Uh, so basically, that's uh, just confirming that indeed we, d we do have differences or we do have heterogeneity in the impact of payment delays uh, on savings. So essentially, that's uh, uh, my study, just to show you some of the results uh, that I have. I thought this would be enough uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, I have, uh, of course, to express my sincere gratitude. Um, I am very thankful to the African Studies Center for making this possible, making it possible that I come to the U of M, um, and of course, I interact with uh, some of the finest minds I would never have imagined in my life. But uh, they made that possible, and I am sincerely uh, grateful. I'm thankful to my home department for making it or for allowing me to come. I am also highly indebted to uh, my, my host, uh, Professor Dean Yang, who is here. Um, uh, he has literally been there through it all, and uh, I, am, I would never be uh, any more thankful. I really, really appreciate it. I am thankful to uh, Professor Chris, who has inspired my writing, of course, um, since I got here. I'm highly uh, thankful. Thanks to uh, my fellow uh, UMAPS uh, scholars for making this fun. You've always uh, made this fun. Um, and yeah, I should also thank my family back home. Um, yeah, I am so uh, grateful. Hopefully, uh, uh, one of them is watching Wesley. Um, I am so thankful. Thank you very much for your time. And thanks for everyone that's here listening physically and virtually. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Laston. Um, Daniel, remember to also check if we have anybody on, on Zoom with questions. But um, time for questions for Laston. Diane. Uh, thanks, Laston, for that presentation. It was really mind intriguing. And uh, I think my question is, let me just give a comment. We, we There is a small uh, arrangement around the, in Uganda where they give older people, senior citizens, cash transfers. It started around, I think, 2015, <coughs> around there. But we've always complained, you're giving old people very little money and then you delay delivering it. So. When you started saying that, I was like, oh, maybe that's the trick they are trying. <laughs> 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 yeah. But then I, I, I just wanted to think about the whole presentation and the question that comes to my mind is that if you're giving these cash transfers, in my mind, I thought they can never work. Of course, I'm not an economist. <laughs> because basically, you're giving people money <laughs> Because I, I'm thinking about myself as a salary earner. Usually by the time I get a salary, I've spent half of it before it comes onto the account. And now you're giving these cash transfers to the seemingly poor person who might have extra needs. How does this saving now happen? That's what is still uh, bothering me. How are they even able? to save on what cash transfer you, you give and how can we even call that one a saving if in the first place it was a transfer of a sort? Yeah, that's my question. Right, um, I, that's, that's a really interesting, uh, really interesting question. Uh, I must admit before I also delved deep into this literature, I was also a little skeptical about uh, these transfers, but uh, I think enough Studies have been conducted, impact evaluations uh, have been conducted just to uh, talk to that story. In terms of the impact, uh, these seem to be working. 
Um, now, I, I, I think your, your question uh, mainly is about um, the, maybe one of the key issues we talk about is the design. How do we design uh, cash transfers? So for example, some people will be arguing that maybe you should help a whole bunch of people. Each of them gets a smaller amount because of budget constraints, of course. Or you help a few people, each of which, uh, or each of whom will get a larger amount and so on and so forth. We have all that research that's also uh, being done. But um, the key argument uh, that I am trying to drive in this case is you get a payment and really you don't, um, so presumably you don't get to eat all of that now. Suppose somebody is just getting uh, a transfer that's equivalent to today's lunch, and then maybe we don't have to talk about savings. But if you're getting money that can go a little further, then maybe we can be talking about all of these savings. So uh, I think um, in that case, so uh, just to answer or relate to your question, we are talking about people who are getting a transfer that's at least uh, a little more than today's consumption. Uh, so maybe uh, that's just one thing uh, we could keep in mind. But I mean, I understand there are all these design uh, issues uh, that we do have even with uh, cash transfer uh, programs. Pierre. Uh, thank you, Lestan, for the presentation. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself last time. So I'm Pierre Mubiai from uh, the University of uh, Vetwatersrand. I'm doing chemistry, and I'm uh, part of the UMAP scholars. Uh, Lestan, uh, the last uh, uh, diagram that you showed about the payment delay, and uh, uh, I don't, uh, yeah, your conclusion was that uh, D2 was uh, from the poorest uh, uh, site and the D10 was for the richest and you showed that the trend was increasing, was changing as you're moving from the lowest to the highest. But uh, may you please comment uh, D4 and D9 because I see D9 is lower compared to D4 mm. specifically. Yeah, even D5 and D7 uh, and so on. So maybe you can uh, maybe put a comment specifically D4 and D9. But I don't know if you can check there. Yeah, the trend is not really following. But uh, I don't know the conclusion when you say D10. It's a kind of implying what you said, but the in between says otherwise. So okay. No. Um, yeah, I, I totally understand, especially if we talk about D4 and D5. Um, yes, yes. Generally, the trend yes. will be up, uh, rising, uh, except maybe if we talk about D4 and D5. But I mean. Uh, in econometric research, uh, this is not very surprising. Uh, in the end, what matters is the average. So on average, what trend do we observe? This could be explained by noise within the data. So this, uh, this data was done for about 474 observations. Maybe if we got a little more uh, observations, something could, uh, or we could have that perfect line you would normally be looking for. But uh, in the end, really, uh, what matters in this case is the average that we have. And of course, we also observe the same impact. Uh, so this is just a measure of wealth uh, that is more continuous. But we also have uh, a measure of, uh, of um, wealth. Uh, rather, this is categorical, not continuous. So we have these different categories. But we also have a, a measure of wealth that's continuous. And that's clear when you look at uh, that measure. And of course, I couldn't show the estimates from there. But when we have the continuous variable, you actually see uh, with uh, statistical significance uh, that uh, indeed wealthier people are able to save uh, more because of the, uh, the payment delay than, than poorer people. So I would say maybe just look for the average trend uh, uh, in, in, in this diagram. Thank you. Um, Sevias and purity. <laughs> the economist. <laughs> Yeah, um, thanks, uh, last one. Sevias Gugurero, that's my name. And yes, thanks for, your, for the interesting presentation and also giving me a whole list of books to read, the behavioral economics books. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Uh, my question, so uh, you said you did this as an experiment. So the last graph, how is it comparing the treated and the untreated? In other words, yeah, the control as well as the treated group. Mm -hmm. In that, do you have the treated and the untreated? Um, yeah, we do have 
we, so we are basically taking treatment effects. So we, so since you are an economist, I don't know if I should answer your question. No, 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 well, I'm answered. I'm yeah, answered. but, but we so do much. have both. No, 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 we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, I didn't see your Y axis. Now I've seen it. Thank you so okay. much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, purity. But, but last one for those who are not economists, treatment effect is? Uh, basically the impact, how, uh, what's uh, the level of impact? Uh, let's just say on average, uh, how, yeah, how does uh, uh, the payment delay affect savings? So, 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 yes, so, it's it's just uh, what you say is the level of, of treatment. Yeah. So if you look at the big team, these are the poor people, and if you look at the big team, big, big chain, these are the non-poor people. So the non-poor people who are actually treated, they tend to they pay say far more, more than mm -hmm. those that are not treated. Yep. But we don't, we see just a little when it comes to the, the, the those that are very poor, mm -hmm. which is the big team. Okay. So the treatment effect is the difference between the treated and the, and the, untreated. And the untreated populations. Yeah. Thank you. Purity. Oh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Purity Modoni uh, from uh, Kenya, a UMAP scholar. Now, I would have queried your data uh, had I not been involved in social work before. So now I, I don't want to look at this as an academia, but from uh, uh, the, my, 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 my past works. So I'm still stuck at the point of uh, how does payment delay become an asset. I, I think it's such an injustice and it causes so much anguish, you, you know, for, for it to start being considered uh, as a, a factor that would drive someone to save, that is where I was left at. Otherwise, I, I can flow with the rest of the data. But having worked for the World Food Program where we administered uh, these cash transfers, I could see the anguish when the payments are delayed. So, so it, got, it can't get to my mind how then we start looking at it from the aspect of it, it can drive people to <laughs> save, how? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a brilliant comment. Uh, and indeed, do I need to address it? Sure. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting that's a really interesting uh, uh, thing. And indeed, uh, payment delays from the people's point of view should be frustrating. Uh, but uh, I already talked about, or the theory of mental accounting already talks about those mental accounts. Basically, just planning. You are able to plan ahead. And of course, you can also have so many other reasons. Uh, so, for example, if you you have been promised this payment or a windfall amount at some at some point, uh, an amount of money. You will be able to tell your neighbor. So you tell your partner, you tell uh, who, your children or whoever that we will be getting such, such an amount of money. Uh, this money is going into, uh, so maybe we're investing in this person's education, just for example. So uh, within behavioral economics, as I said, we talk about these psychological factors. Uh, you are most likely going to spend that amount of money into education simply because, for example, you've taught someone and you beyond yourself creating those mental accounts. You have also had uh, those uh, uh, external influences. So for example, if you don't, most likely there will be some shame that comes to you if you don't do what you promised. Uh, so most likely eventually, uh, in be behavioral economics, we just look at uh, those psychological factors. Most likely you could end up also uh, saving more or investing into that simply because you were able, with the amount of time or the waiting time, you were able to tell people and they act to monitor your behavior uh, in some way. Uh, in some psycho psychological way because of all that shame, guilt, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. Hopefully, I have added a reason as to why these delays uh, can actually be important uh, within the context. Um, John Doe, which will be our last question. John? Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, my name is John Doe. Yes, John Doe is my name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, to continue from where uh, purity has left off. It is quite difficult to understand what we are talking about. <laughs> because the point is, um, okay, for uh, uh, an example, 
my, 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 my dad, who is in the village, who is expecting something from me at the end of the month. Whilst waiting, he knows this money will come. By the time the money comes, he has already borrowed, uh, gone for stuff. <laughs> you know, on credit. Waiting for this money to come at the end of the month so that he can go and pay back his debt. Because there's nothing coming from anywhere apart from that. So if you are saying that this payment, they, it, 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 they know the, this is coming. They know that this money is coming. And then right now, I need to live to be alive for the money to come. So if I don't have enough to eat today, am I going to be waiting till that money comes? Or anyway, I don't know. <laughs> How to explain it further? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally, I totally understand. Uh, that's a really uh, interesting instance you give. Um, I, 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 I think uh, so. Looking at this with uh, the lenses of uh, trying to look at this with the lenses of a behavioral economist, um, I think there's, there could be so many factors that come uh, in that that come in in that case. So, for example, uh, your dad could know that uh, once, uh, once. Uh, that payment comes at the end of the month, there will be another one at the end of the next month. And there is, we could be sure that he will be getting the, all these. Uh, but in this case, we could also be talking about one-time one payment. So for example, within this experiment, we are talking about a one-time payment. So they only got the transfer once. And of course, you could also talk about issues of trust. Your dad definitely trusts that you will give the money at the end of the month. Suppose the government or some institution tells you you get money. Do you trust them in the same way you would trust your child? Uh, so there are so many psychological issues that really uh, could be driving all of this. And I think it's also worth uh, studying uh, within these uh, uh, field experiments uh, context. But I totally understand uh, this instance where you could have uh, people actually saving uh, beforehand. And uh, this all just leads or feeds into the design of cash transfers. How do we, how best do we design uh, cash transfers at, at the end of the day? Can I, uh, can I just interject yeah, something here? Yes, I actually wanted to. This is, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, this is Dean Young. Um, I think uh, um, there's a difference between a late payment that has been promised on a certain date and a payment where you say in advance, we promised you're gonna get this payment, but it's coming in the future. So when Lawson is talking about a payment delay, he's not saying, he's not think, talking about a situation where you've been promised a payment on a certain date, and then it's late. That's not the situation. He's basically saying, today I'm telling you, you're getting money in eight days. That's, 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 all, that's, all, exactly. that, that's all that he's saying. That, that's what the payment delay means in this context. I didn't want to jump in earlier, I want, but. <laughs> Thank you very much. And basically, so this is not a situation where any payment is late. You know, the payment is happening exactly when it was <laughs> promised. But it's just that some people are being told about it eight days in advance. And some people are, are, get, are, are getting the money the very moment that they're told about it. So some people get it. Some people, everyone is being surprised, right? Nobody knew they were getting this money. They show up at the bank, and then some people get it that moment. It's literally handed to them. And other people are, say, are told, you're getting this money, but it's, it's coming in eight days. You know, so there's no lateness in, in, in this situation. I, t I, I totally, certainly agree that like, we don't want to think about a situation where we're intentionally making people's payments arrive later than they expected. So I, I said much. it was last question, but I saw Pierre kind of jumping up. Do you have a short comment? <laughs> that, oh, okay. <laughs> I think the clarification has been brought to, to us, but uh, um, like in South Africa, there are many type of accounts. You can open an account where you can have access to your money with a certain, uh, a certain delay. So I don't know if that delay is what, what you're talking about, or like that uh, it's, it's intentional. You know already that, no, I will not get the money immediately when I want to accept my money. So it's not to say that they are delaying your money whereas you're supposed to get it that same moment. So I don't know if that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, I think, I yeah. think that's the okay. same thing. Thank yeah. you.
And you know, I've said it was the last question, but now Diana is jumping up. That's really the last comment. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> anyway, I just want to give, I'm trying to understand last one now, and I want to give my experience. My first job, I worked for a project where our payments were very, very unpredictable. You didn't know when you got paid. Sometimes you get, you get paid after three months, other times after two months, and it so happened that you had to live your life so much in an organized manner such that because it's unpredictable, you, you don't get money when you expect it, so you cut out the luxuries of what you would have spent on. And sometimes by the time this money comes, you actually have it a lot at once, and you can actually put it somewhere. So I'm trying to understand last one in that regard. Yeah, yeah I think that's, uh, that's a very good way of understanding. And that's, I think, in line with what was, as I mentioned, this was a one-time payment, so w once you get it, you know you have to make the best use of it. Because, I mean, you're not promised you get another one. And so, I think, so I think it's, uh, it's really uh, a nice way of looking at uh, things. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Also to our participants on Zoom, I know we had a few. There are still cookies and coffee, so take some now. Before you leave, take some with you when you leave, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.